Hello, this is Telecom TV. We are at the Great Telco Debate 2019 in the City of London. I'm talking once more with Andrew Coward, CEO of Lumina Networks. Andrew, as usual, great to see you and thanks for talking to us. It's Martin. I'd like to begin by asking you, how far are we along the journey to cloud native? We have heard over several days and various events that it is a journey. It's a finite journey, but the length of that finite journey depends on where you, you know, how you look at it. It's sort of this week, next week, sometime, never, whatever. How far along do you think we are? Well, if you think about companies that are really cloud native with everything they've done kind of from the ground up. So yeah. think of companies like Netflix, for example, um, very well kind of laid out that way. From a telco perspective, um, there's a huge amount of technical debt that's really owed for us to get there or to put it another way, we can't get there from here unless we do some very different and dramatic things to the way we're managing and controlling networks today. First of all, explain about the technical debt. Why is a technical debt owed? Well, you can think of the network today as being um, fairly manually configured or perhaps static. Um, and you can think of the, the telcos as kind of almost like spinning plates. So they've got these plates that are spinning uh, and they're trying to manage everything. And with 5G, um, which is intricately linked with what we're going to do with Telco Cloud and things, um, then there's a 10x increment in base stations. There's a 10x increment in backhaul connectivity and all the complexity that goes with that. So it's going to be quite impossible to keep all those plates spinning with the technology we've got. And so the journey that most telcos are on, albeit perhaps too slowly, is that of digitization and automation. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about how that then will play out. But, but from a fundamental perspective, until the network is automated, you can't really make these applications and everything cloud native because the rest of the network, the optical infrastructure, the, the cell towers, the backhaul, all of these things have to be dragged along, if you like, with this new technology, which is a problem that Netflix never really had because they rely on that infrastructure just being there for them. Okay. So if you're dragging this along, and this is, this is the debt, you know, a bit like uh, Jacob Marley with <laughs> chains clanking away, but very apt for Christmas, by the way. Um, what, how do you go about doing that? Who's going to be paying for this? Are they going to be willing to pay for it? Can they manage without paying for it? Well, it's, it's about where you start. So um, again, I don't think anybody recognises this shouldn't be done, and it's not a question of whether you pay for it or you don't, you, you have to do this as a matter of course uh, if you're going to get to 5G and if you're going to get to a cloud native architecture. So the, the payment side is really how do I get the money back? Well the money comes back in two, in, well actually three ways. And the first is because um, if you've automated and, and normalized all your vendors um, then you're now you know, easily introducing new vendors. So you get a competitive advantage, or rather you get the, the, the competitors they are in the market fighting for your business, if you like, because it doesn't take two years now to introduce uh, a new vendor. So you get CapEx savings. That was what people first thought about moving to digitization and automation. So AT&T's domain 2.0 project, for example, um, initially focused on CapEx. The second part was operational costs and operational savings. So if you're not uh, having to have people manually configure everything, then, then clearly you're going to get operational savings. Reality is that um, those people end up doing other things. But the third part, which I think is more interesting, is the business agility that it that, that this then brings you. So the cost savings that come are, are really actually incremental revenue or the ability to be more competitive. So for example, we have customers who having automated and digi digitized the network infrastructure, or at least parts of it, are now selling those services to their competitors because they can turn them on in seconds and not weeks and hours. And so that agility is, is really what we're aiming for and that's what pays the bills. Okay. What about you at Lumina then, talking about agility, what is it you're doing to facilitate this? Right. So what we, what we try and do is we, we say, okay, well, where do you start? So if we can't, you can't get there from here, <laughs> if you like. So where is it that you have to start from? And so we look at things that um, can, can benefit from automation very quickly. So for example, uh, a number of customers right now, we're focused on backhaul uh, and automating that. Now again, traditionally, you'd have each vendor having their own management system. You, ma you, you do the configuration management for one side, then you go off to the next piece and do that. Well, so basically bringing that into an automation framework using open source, using projects like Open Daylight um, to drive control of that infrastructure. So regardless of the vendor at the radio, 
in the in the optical network and in the IP network, you're then managing the service as one. So I turn on back all connectivity. But we're not trying to solve everything in one go. It's this one piece of the network first, and then you've got APIs that then hook in to, to call and make bandwidth requests of that part of the infrastructure. I also heard yesterday um, that when the time comes when all this is complete and we have 5G as it should be and we have a transform network and we have digitization and automation everywhere, that's the baseline for the next thing that happens, whatever that may be. Have you heard that argument? Well, it's the, if you don't solve the technical debt, you can't get to whatever that, <laughs> that next thing is. Right? Well, and people talk about 5G as being, you know, it's, it's extra speed and, and bandwidth and capacity. Um, that's part of it. But the big part of it is the ability to dynamically provision and, and, and control different parts of the and slices of the network. So I can deliver these new amazing applications. So I can deliver very low latency um, augmented reality headsets so that I can deliver very low bandwidth, very, um, very fre infrequent connectivity, like my washing machine, for example. <laughs> um, very different aspects of the network. Today in 4G treated exactly the same, in a 5G network treated very differently. So once we have that capacity uh, and ability, then it kind of unbounds applications. And maybe we don't even care what G it is at that point, but we do care about you know, what the consumer um, application is or con consumer benefit is or what the, the business impact is. So back to Lumina, Andrew. So where are you now in this whole change situation? What part are you playing and how right. important is it? Well, I, I mean, different, our different customers are in different places. As I mentioned, at and um, kind of went first with a lot of these things. That There are long ways through that. And, and it really is about bringing every single um, device in the network, from a core router to a cell site router to a radio base station to an optical piece of equipment to a customer's premise equipment under the control and automation bound into a service. Um, and so if they've got the furthest along, the customers we're working with now in Europe are just kind of at the beginning of that journey. Um, and not everybody in the industry has kind of got the memo yet. Um, <laughs> so we're kind of working on that, right? Um, so from that perspective then, for, for us, uh, with every interaction we do, with every um, automation you know what we do with with our, the open source projects that we in, in you know use that takes um, us more and more to a, pl a place where the next customer just becomes so much easier because we've already integrated all these products we've already integrated all these different services we know what these things are supposed to look like so in the two and a half years that we've been around independently as Lumina and from the three years before in Brocade you know we've got this, this kind of five-year history now of, of really understanding how how to make this stuff work Thanks, Andrew. Can we loop back to where we started then and go back to cloud native? Uh, is that the end game as far as your customers and as far as Luminar is concerned, or does it go further? Well, let's think about the outcomes. So when we get to cloud native, what we're saying is that all the packet processing and, and, and data that goes flows through the network is now virtualized and can be moved around. It can be moved from the core to the edge, wherever it's needed for whatever function that you're trying to deploy. That's a massive impact, right? So we're no longer using proprietary hardware to do most of the packet processing. It's, it's now just in generic x86. So that's a, that's a huge outcome and a huge win. Um, we get to that point. We think about the agility that customers then have as, without even knowing that they're experiencing agility, I suppose. Uh, meaning that <laughs> you know, they just turn on a, a virtual reality headset and it just works on 5G. Um, or they drive their car and it just communicates and, and gets what it needs from the cars, the traffic lights and everything else. Those are the things that um, the network itself will deliver as a consequence of getting to this highly agile um, telco cloud, cloud native application base. And that gives us the foundation of, of which to grow the next G for wherever that comes. I shall look forward to it. Andrew Coward, thanks very much. Thanks, Martin.